I'm going to talk about the six element practice because in the course especially of teaching in India I've discovered things that people don't seem to know about the practice. Things that have been clear to me, I don't know why, uh, but don't seem to be clear certainly to people in India and I think even maybe in the West. So I want to make a few things a bit explicit which may or may not be useful to you. I'm talking of course in the context of what I spoke about this morning. Uh, I spoke then about uh, this, um, this spirit, this um, inspiring spirit that makes everything we do um, meaningful. But I don't want it to be thought that I'm talking about um, something that excludes anything else, if you see what I mean. It's only possible for that suprapersonal spirit uh, to be experienced and, uh, and um, uh, communicated if we are practicing integration, positive emotion, uh, dhammic receptivity, dhammic death and dhammic rebirth. It's only possible if all of those are alive. It's only possible if the other lineages are alive. I'm not talking about something merely institutional. The institution is simply one dimension of what I'm talking about. And a very important part of uh, allowing that, let's call it spirit, to work through us and to be amongst us and for us to dwell in is to die, to die spiritually. And I'm really pleased that there has been a, a much greater emphasis amongst many more order members on, uh, on dhammic death, insight, whatever you want to call it. Uh, one can hardly object to that. And, uh, you know, people have found their own ways into it, which is fair enough. If it works, uh, who can be against uh, the real experience of uh, at least a degree of diminution of self-clinging? And in a way, it doesn't matter how it comes about. I think the only reservation I'd have to that is one needs to be very careful it does sort of work in to the overall common language and common uh, experience so that one doesn't want to build up a way of thinking about it that's out of tune with the order as a whole and that doesn't relate back to what Bante teaches. I don't think that's necessary with anything that I've come across or seen. Uh, it's a question of uh, recognizing the value of a shared uh, language uh, and experience even, and uh, finding ways of bringing one's own uh, particular experience into relationship with a larger one. And that's extremely important, especially if we're talking about self-clinging, because there's a, a, a strong tendency in the Buddhist world, generally, for people to cling terribly hard to not self-clinging, if you see what I mean. The whole language of insight becomes terribly me -y which is the very opposite of what it should be. So I think it's really important that whatever experience we do have of a diminution of, of self-clinging is sort of immersed in something larger. That's why it's important. It's important to, uh, uh, to engage with the larger community uh, and to bring one's own experience into relationship with that. It's not just into relationship with it, but bring it into that larger experience because that's what we're trying to do. That's what spiritual death is about. So uh, I myself have, have uh, engaged with, uh, with an insight practice right from the start and it was uh, um, hearing Bante talk about these things that really got me going in the, in the Dhamma life. And uh, especially since ordination, well, I, I very strongly took to the six element practice at that time. And since ordination, uh, I did the Vajrasattva practice to begin with. Then after two or three years, I, I did the uh, Manjushri Stuti Sadhana after Bhante led a seminar on it. And the, the formula of uh, recitation of Um Swabhava Shuddha, Sarva Dharma Swabhava Shuddha Ho Hung, was extremely important to me. And I'd spend quite a lot of time in the, uh, in the sadhana, dwelling upon, upon that, uh, that element of the practice and trying to fathom its meaning. But I realize I'm me, 
other people are them. And we all come at things in our own way, from our own character and, and uh, history and so forth. And uh, it seems that that's not been so evident to others uh, for whatever reason. Maybe there hasn't been a, a sufficiently widespread communication of, uh, of that dimension and how to engage with it. I can't say I feel that myself or that I've not done it myself, but it seems that uh, for some people, uh, discovering uh, insight practice and uh, insight experience is, is something uh, very fresh and new, and I rejoice. I rejoice greatly. But just ask that people work that into what we have in common and use a common language for it without, of course, diminishing or changing or altering the experience itself. But if it really is an experience of uh, some degree of self-transcendence, then you'll be glad to, if you see what I mean. Because it's, if one isn't glad to, it tells one that it's, it's a rather clingy sort of lack of self-clinging. And in the end, the method doesn't matter. But uh, that's, that's led me to think that there's probably more that I have got from the six element practice than that other people have got from it. And I'd just like to have the temerity to share what I've got from it and how I understand it, at least a little bit in the time that's available to me. Um, if I'm teaching my grandfather mothers to suck eggs um, because you've let go of self-clinging you won't mind um, but um, you can consider it a test oh god that old hat you know? um, but uh, if it's something useful then so, so be it um, for me the, the, the background to the, the six element practice from fairly on has been the, uh, uh, the teaching of the three pragnas and uh, I've got a bit deeper insight into this more recently, which I'd like to communicate to you. So I'm going to talk about the three pragnas first. And, well, in the course of doing that, I'll probably begin to show how I understand those working with the six element practice itself. So we all know the formula of the, 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 the three pragnas, uh, Shruta Mai Pragna, the, uh, the pragna, the wisdom, the penetrative wisdom, because pragna here is something that breaks through delusion. It's not the having of wisdom, it's the getting to wisdom, if you see what I mean. Uh, it's the wisdom that consists in hearing, uh, shruta. Um, and uh, that's succeeded by chintamai pragna, uh, the, the wisdom that consists in uh, reflection, thinking. And finally, bhavna mai pragna, the wisdom that consists in, ah, well, what does it consist in? It's usually said in meditating. I'm not completely happy with that as a translation, although let's leave it prov prov <coughs> provisionally as that. Bhavana, uh, of course, is, a, is um, a root word meaning, or rather it's a word meaning um, uh, becoming. Um, and... It can mean making to become or developing. It's interesting, in modern Indian languages, bhava and bhavana means more to do with feeling, um, which is a source of confusion in India. Um, but uh, that is one of the, 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 the meanings within the original term. It's sort of experiencing, you could say. Anyway, we'll come on to that because I think a, a rereading of bhavana is quite important in, in my understanding. So, Shrutamai Pragna is pretty straightforward. It's hearing a presentation of the Dhamma. Here, uh, the Dhamma related to the way things really are, that is to the three Lakshanas. Uh, just hearing it. Hearing what is taught uh, and being clear about it. <coughs> um, <coughs> everything is impermanent. Um, <coughs> There is no substantial independent self. Uh, um, what, what appears cannot be a source of satisfaction, indeed clung to as a source of pain, uh, and, and so on. So Shruttamai Pragna is just hearing that, understanding it in the most basic way, recognizing what the words mean, how they relate to each other, and understanding uh, what is being communicated. 
even learning it, learning it off by heart. Um, the non-repetition of the sacred Dhamma is its decay. If you don't keep on going over and over it, if you don't repeat it day after day after day, it just disappears. That's one thing I used to find with Um Swabhava Shuddha Sarva Dharma. I was just revisiting that every day. And uh, it therefore is a, a very strong part of my way of looking at the world. So Shruttamai Pragnya is uh, hearing, understanding in the, in the most uh, basic conceptual sense what is being said. Um, maybe even an, in a slightly fuller sense. Um, uh, Chintamai Pragnya is not just thinking about it. And I think this is where uh, people go wrong with the, the six element practice often. It's not just having the thoughts pass through your mind. It's not even just um, uh, sort of giving a superficial intellectual assent to those words. It's, uh, in the end, if you like, testing to destruction. If you see what I mean, it's applying a, a rigorous, even logical, rational uh, reflection upon the words that are being used. So you're, you're um, for instance, in the six element practice, you're starting off by saying that there's the earth element inside me, and you even think about the elements. Um, and, uh, well, in a way you could say that's a fairly straightforward uh, recognition. But you may even find that even when, you're, when you're, you're saying those words, there's some element of doubt, uh, some is, is really the earth element inside me. Perhaps this is too superficial to really get it. It gets more when you get on to the, the, the others, um, uh, especially, well, fire is a bit complex for people and space and, uh, well, consciousness is the most uh, problematic in terms of reflection. But uh, then you go on to say, well, the, the earth element is outside me. And again, that's probably not too hard to, to grasp. Once you've accepted the, the, the ana analytic of the practice, the six elements, which for some people is a bit complicated already, but you need to be convinced that that's uh, about how they are analysed, if you see what I mean. You need to understand what the elements are and uh, recognise that you're not just talking about earth, you're talking about solidity, even as a quality of energy. Uh, so you need to understand that. And I think extremely important in the six element practice, often overlooked, is the importance of the, the reflection being very closely tied to some actual experience. Uh, I always now, because of my experience in India, where people can oddly um, get um, very abstract about the practice, uh, I always emphasize, first of all, feeling, for instance, the contact of your body with the, the cushion or the chair as a contact of earth element with earth element, with uh, the, the, the water element, cont uh, feeling the, the, the blood flowing through your body, even hearing it singing in your ears, as it were, feeling the saliva in your mouth, actually connecting in some way with the, the physical dimension of, of, uh, of that uh, the physical experience of that element. You can't, you know, you can't feel the bones or whatever, but if, as long as you felt something to do with the element, then your reflection is, uh, is directed uh, concretely to some degree. When you move on to start thinking, well, the element outside me is the same as the element inside me, this is when you begin to need to uh, make sure you don't be too superficial. Um, you need to start uh, sort of questioning quite closely. It's even quite useful to introduce an element of doubt, deliberate doubt. Is the element inside me the same as the element outside me? Even you might ask yourself, how do I know? Uh, what is the basis for that understanding? You keep on pushing till uh, you become really convinced 
going to say more about this conviction in a, in a little while, but you, you push on to the point at which there's no doubt in your mind. This is probably the hardest thing with this particular practice is, uh, because so much of it's so obvious, is to really become convinced, if you see what I mean. We too prematurely, too superficially give assent, and it just becomes a set of formulae that we repeat over and over. But you really need to get to the point with each phase in the classic way of it being presented, which comes from the uh, Majjhima Nikaya, from the Datu Vibhanga Sutta, and then from the exposition in the um, Vishuddhimagga, and then Bhante's exposition coming from Mr. Chen, the formulae are actually quite important. You go through them and you convince yourself. Watching, I think, is very important with this sort of uh, um, uh, uh, pragna, this chintamai pragna, that you're aware of the doubt in your mind. Uh, probably a major element in the success with the practice is being able to identify any voice of doubt in your mind. Often people, for instance, who are scientifically minded or trained or medically trained or whatever, start quarrelling with the practice uh, because, of course, you know, it's anatomy and, uh, and so forth is a bit clunky. So you have to push into that and push beyond it. Otherwise, you'll be doing the practice with your fingers crossed, if you see what I mean. Um, and with all, all, all insight... It's really important to be able to identify the element of doubt in you. Because what you find with insight reflection is that well, what you're trying to do with insight reflection is to pass beyond concepts to experience. And we too easily uh, remain with superficial conceptual understanding. And we don't push down to the experience that... Uh, uh, lies beyond that when we really are convinced. Maybe I'm going to have to talk about conviction because I think it's, it's quite an important part of my exposition. Um, if, if, you do, if, you, if, you're, um, if you doubt something and somebody then manages to convince you of uh, the truth of that, if you... If you um, <laughs> I've got to think of an example on the spur of the moment. If, if you, if you um, uh, doubt that um, uh, we really do have a, a centre in, in, uh, in Coddington, uh, let's say, um, uh, when you actually see it, you're convinced. No, it's not a good example. Uh, I should have thought about this in advance. Um, but... Uh, um, OK. I won't give an example. <laughs> um, you're, you, you, um, with, with this six element practice, you notice that there's an underlying sense of reservation, that there's something in you that hasn't bought it. And identifying that not having bought it is most of the battle, if you see what I mean. Identifying that you are not convinced is most of the battle. If, with all insight practice, whatever kind, uh, the most important thing is to notice that conceptual understanding covers a deeper uh, uh, non-conviction. We all know that everything's impermanent. We all can give talks on it. We can all uh, uh, give very convincing expositions of it. But we know that when impermanence happens, so to speak, in an uncomfortable way, we're taken by surprise. So what we're trying to do in, in, in insight practice always is to push below the conceptual understanding, using conceptual understanding, to the point of, um, of doubt. It's almost the most important thing in, in, in uh, um, insight practice, I think, is doubt, call it that. This sense of, oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, I'm not convinced. Then when you convince yourself, um, the experience of conviction is not merely rational. You are rationally convinced and, and convinced deeply, 
But if you've, if you've investigated your doubt deeply enough, the rational conviction becomes a, uh, a sort of whole acceptance of uh, whatever it is that you're reflecting upon. Uh, and it passes beyond reason. Reason always is the translation of experience into uh, abstract conceptual terms. But when you uh, interrogate those abstract conceptual terms deeply enough, they themselves open up into direct experience. So that at least for a while, uh, you sit not merely thinking, however deeply thinking that everything is impermanent, you know that everything is impermanent. You sit in impermanence. So I call this the, 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 uh, the, the mood, the experience of conviction ensuing upon this vigorous, even rigorous, even logical inquiry into whatever is the subject of reflection. Uh, and uh, uh, in the six element practice, it's a reflection on on the interaction between the element within you and without you. It's the reflection on the fact that that element didn't come in with you, that it's been coming and going from within you all through your life and that it eventually goes. You, you go through all those reflections until you recognize that they are true. Then you reflect that nowhere within uh, that element is anything permanent or fixed, anything that you can identify with, anything that you can hold on to, anything that you can grasp and say, that's me. And again, you do that to the point at which you are convinced. In a way, you sort of almost shouldn't go on with the practice until you're convinced at each level. Because the, the skill of the six element practice, which I think is an extremely profound practice is that it goes over the same ground again and again on subtle and subtler energic levels. Do you see what I mean? So it starts with very gross uh, um, uh, solid experience and then well you know more and more subtle experience until you're ending up with with just consciousness itself. Um, uh, consciousness as the Buddha says that is uh, um, uh, very pure very bright um, parishuddhati paribhadhati uh, um, uh, yodhati pariyodhati uh, very shining, very bright, very pure so your, your, the practice itself leads you subtly through increasingly uh, refined levels of clinging and if you vigorously engage with each one at its own level if you put yourself through the, uh, the mechanics of the practice, um, doubting at every stage, uh, working at every stage until you are completely convinced um, of the truth of that stage, then uh, you are sort of released into this experience of conviction, which uh, in my um, experience such as it is, is one of uh, wordlessness. You just sit there. Uh, you just sit there with the, uh, the sort of momentum of the reflection. Uh, you just sit there uh, a kind of knowing it's true without any words in your mind. And uh, you sit there until it begins to go. And then back you go and you go through it all again until you're completely convinced. Um, of course, you know, that's going to take a lifetime of, of working. Insight is never a single uh, event. Sometimes you hear people talking about before insight and after insight. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that process of before and after goes on all the way through Dhamma life. Um, you know, from, from right from the start, as far as I was concerned, I was engaging with insight and I'm engaging with insight on deeper and deeper levels all the time. And I presume I will do until I completely, uh, liberate, uh, completely liberated in, uh, in Arahatva or whatever, uh, if one wants to take that line of inquiry. Insight isn't a one-off event. It's a process that one engages with on deeper and deeper levels. So the practice is asking you to do that. 
It's engaging you with uh, uh, reflection, a vigorous intellectual inquiry, a, a strong, uh, even logical uh, approach. It doesn't have to be very complicated or very philosophical, uh, but uh, you need to go on until you're completely convinced and no sort of doubting words are coming into your mind. And then you stay with that conviction. That is Bhavna Mai Pragna. Bhavna Mai Pragna is where you're sitting with the conviction that's arisen from the vigorous reflection leading, leading up to it. Do you see what I mean? So that you, you just stay with that. You, Bhavana here is making that into you, making it your, your baseline, making it where you come from. And you do that again and again and again. You deliberately go through the process. If you short circuit it, uh, you're not going to go sufficiently deep. You may have a nice experience, but you're not going to go sufficiently deep. So you go over it again and again, so that you work it in deeper and deeper and deeper into the whole structure of your mind as it arises moment by moment. So that it becomes more and more you, where you come from, your baseline. Uh, and there's no point at which it's happened and that's that. Um, and um, you, know, you can put a certificate on the wall. There's no moment of that, I'm sorry. It, it has to be done again and again on deeper and deeper levels until, uh, uh, well, it has to be done again and again and again. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. And um, uh, you have to uh, keep on coming back to experience, the direct experience of the, of the elements within you. You have to keep on coming back to using the framework of the practice to uh, reflect upon that experience uh, and to question it, to interrogate it until you get to the point at which you are convinced. And then you stay with that conviction. In the, uh, in the um, Dhatu Vibhanga Sutta, uh, the Buddha speaks in, the, in more or less in the formula that Bhante gave us. And then uh, he, he says after each, each um, element, uh, after, after you a, attain uh, an understanding of the nature of each element and, and free yourself from it, you experience um, um, nibida and viraga. Uh, um, yeah, you know, from the spiral path. You experience, well, disentanglement. In other words, a, um, you, you're still close enough to entanglement to know what entanglement is like, and you don't want it. Uh, the best illustration I've got of this is experience is going to um, Ikea with uh, Sangadeva. Um, he was helping me to buy some things from Ikea uh, and very kindly came with me. And I, we were walking around Ikea and he had a silly grin on his face. And I thought, oh, he's seen things he wants. So I sort of said to him, oh, Sangadeva, you seem to be really enjoying this. He said, yeah, I'm really enjoying this. There's absolutely nothing here that I want. <laughs> that, I think, is a sort of nibidita. Do you know what I mean? There's a sort of recognition that it's kind of could pull you, but you don't want to go there. Um, Vairagya is you don't even notice it. You just float through Ikea and it... It's, um, it's uh, um, um, tool off a of duck's back. That was, a, <laughs> that was an Ikea name I've made up. <laughs> it doesn't even pull at you, if you see what I mean. Um, so ideally, when you're doing the practice, uh, you get to this point of conviction, and then you, you, you experience the, 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 um, the spiral path and its upper stages. You experience the, um, uh, the, the gravitational pull of the unconditioned. And you just stay with that. Of course, usually what that means, presumably until you're completely liberated, is that you experience some falling back um, until Nibidita is you know, established through regular steps and becomes the permanent baseline of your experience, uh, but we can have some experience of it. You just feel for a while completely detached, uh, completely at ease. If it starts to fade away again, then you can go back and, and restore the, uh, the experience through a degree of reflection. 
that, that's, go back through the, the, even the three pragnas. If your mind wanders, then go back to hearing. It's not me, it's not myself, it's not mine. Uh, go back to reflecting. Is it really not me? Um, am I not really the body? Uh, is this body not really me? Go back to reflecting, go back to interrogating, go back to convincing yourself through chinta mai pragna, and then cruise, so to speak, in bhavna mai pragna. You do that level by level by level, so that um, uh, as the, 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 uh, um, the practice progresses, uh, you're experiencing this sort of sweep through on increasing levels. I think it is important uh, to be working in another more, well, I can only say energic way, uh, which is to do with a sort of mood of letting go. Uh, and uh, some people have a stronger sense of this than others. Um, uh, a, a, the Hindus have a very strong sense of this, apparently. Um, so sort of strong sense that you're just sort of letting go into something bigger, or, or even faith could be another way of talking about it, that you're just opening up uh, to mon something much larger. And that's a strong element in the practice, that um, you, you, um, you, you relax into something bigger and broader. Um, you, you let go of the element. But Bante stressed uh, that uh, letting go is not the right language. It's giving up. Um, because he says that he thinks that there can be a sort of um, a sentimental or, or fantastical experience of of, uh, of um, letting go and relaxing, which um, um, lets you off the hook of really deeply convincing yourself. This is the whole problem, especially for us who are intelligent enough and come from a, a culture which is subtle enough to be able to acknowledge the truth of the Dhamma. The difficulty is working it deeply into our consciousness and conscious experience. And that requires us to use conceptual uh, effort to do so, accompanied by this more kind of energic, faith-driven uh, relaxation and opening up. Do you see what I mean? So the, the practice has all these dimensions. It's a, a, a remarkable practice, and uh, it's, it's, it's quite a tough practice, and I'm not surprised that... Um, sometimes people don't get on with it because it requires quite good circumstances and uh, not everybody's able to build those circumstances around them. And, and you can take parts of the practice and practice them. Uh, sometimes I've done that myself, just take a little fraction of the practice and, and use that. Uh, for instance, I use the phrase often, it's not me, not mine, not myself, um, especially in the midst of reaction. As, um, Another very important practice I haven't got time to talk about now, what I call reaction practice, which I stress is not practicing in reacting, because we're pretty good at that. Uh, Chandrashil and I developed this approach uh, in India because we found that people were very good at giving talks on the Dhamma and uh, very good on retreat, but they never seemed to apply it to themselves in life. Of course, we here in the West, we always do that. We apply it to ourselves. <laughs> in life. But um, we realized that one of the most important um, uh, routes to practice is when we react. Uh, and uh, we've got plenty of opportunities for reaction. And when you're doing the six element practice and you're applying it to your reactions, uh, you've got a very, very powerful nexus, if you see what I mean. A coming together of the three pragnas with an active and often painful experience, if your, your reaction is connected with, with hateful, or even with, um, with craving thwarted. It's, it's painful. It's more difficult to catch craving when it's on its trajectory to fulfillment. Um, but if you can combine the six element practice with its application in the midst of life, when you're... Uh, when you're you know, going through all the, the cycles of reaction that we go through a thousand times a day. Um, you've got a very, very potent combination. It's very, very important to combine them. I think it's very difficult to do effective reaction practice unless you're doing such a punctilious and thorough and focused reflection 
uh, insight reflection as a six element practice. Very difficult to work it deeply enough into you. Um, but if you're not working it into you in your daily life, the six element practice, you can have wonderful experiences. I used to get wonderful experiences from the first time I did it on my first beginner's retreat, led by Bante. We're not supposed to do that, not these days. Uh, but in summary, it's why I'm here, because on that first retreat, I'm not saying you should do it, but on that first retreat, he led the six element practice. Now, very, very strong experience. I knew it was true. Um, relatively superficial, but it, 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 it had a very, very powerful effect on me. It sort of formed my whole approach to the Dhamma. Um, but if you don't, you can have that sort of very positive experience and very insightful experience, but if you're not applying it to the daily business of uh, clinging as it happens moment by moment, it's not going to go anywhere. It's just another acquisition. The terrible danger, I think, with insight that it becomes another acquisition, which is why I think it's so important to put insight into this larger framework of um, um, inspiration, the, 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 the um, uh, the lineage of inspiration and, uh, you know, the, uh, the thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara and us as a community trying to immerse our own uh, separateness in something much larger than us by working together, whether practically within institutions or in other ways. Um, it's really important that we engage in that way. Otherwise, insight doesn't really amount to insight. It just amounts to a little bit of deeper understanding, which is fitted into a, an unexamined selfishness. Um, I think I've probably said enough. I don't want to talk too much. Uh, but perhaps what I've indicated are three main things, well, four main things. The first is I think it's very, very important in the six element practice to uh, relate the practice to actual uh, physical experience. I, I even think of this in relation to the, the space element. Um, a little bit of insight from uh, uh, Schopenhauer, who says that space is actually experienced. And I think he's, he's, he's right. Um, I won't go into that in detail, but uh, you, you, you can even relate to space as an experience, if you see what I mean. You feel that spaciousness, something you feel, not think. Huh? Um, of course, I could say so much about consciousness, but this is, I think, not the time to say it. It's another whole discussion. Um, so, yes, really important with the, the five elements uh, to found each set of reflections on a concrete experience. That prevents it from becoming too heady. At the same time, it's really important to, to get your, your logical, inquiring, uh, doubting mind to grips with the reflection that is uh, given to you, that you heard, that, you, it, that is the shruttamai pragna subject. It's really important to, to grapple with that deeply. And as I say, I think it's very important to notice the twinges of doubt, um, the, 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 the sense that one often just pushes away because intellectually you're convinced. It's really important to try to catch yourself in uh, your, your lack of conviction. Quite difficult to do, actually. Uh, and uh, the more vigorously, the more um, thoroughly you, in, you can inquire, and the more you've been doing that inquiry outside the practice, the better. Uh, the, 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 the deeper the practice will go, and the more you will move towards that uh, mood of conviction. And I hope people have understood what I mean by that, that sort of moment when there's no more thinking to be done because you've you're convinced. You know it's true uh, all the way through, at least to the level that you can see. And that gives rise to a, a definite experience, um, which in, in, in my limited experience is, is one of uh, a sense of freedom, um, 
that, uh, and of relief is often a very strong sense of it, a sense of sort of, whew, you've let go, you, you don't have to, to uh, cling on, at least at that level. And a, a sense of deep confidence, because it's, it's founded in some measure of, of genuine uh, experience. And uh, for a while, you bhavana with that, you, you, you dwell with that. Uh, you don't have to do anything at that stage. You only have to do something if you begin to fall out of it, when you may have to work yourself back into it. And particularly, perhaps, to begin with, you have to do that sort of dance quite often, even sometimes just coming back to the root statement because you may get tangled up in your own thoughts or carried away by drifting mind. You know, and a fair amount of concentration is necessary for this. So you just stay with your conviction. And uh, uh, you, you, uh, uh, you allow that conviction to, to uh, um, sort of dwell, to dwell in that conviction um, as long as it, 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 you can until the next stage comes. And you may feel a bit resistant sometimes to going on to the next stage, but I think you need to have some understanding and confidence in the structure of the practice. Uh, because um, the elements uh, are, it's not merely a sort of scientific analysis, they're analysed in terms of their refinement and subtlety. So that naturally, if you, if you connect with each of the elements as they are, as uh, uh, more and more subtle um, uh, distillations of energy, you naturally find yourself in, uh, nearer and nearer to uh, consciousness itself. Where, where, where matter has become so subtle that its distinction from, from consciousness is uh, um, hardly there. And so you're able then to apply the same momentum, even the same analysis. Of course, it's, it's differently phrased in the case of consciousness, but you're able to apply the same analysis there. And you're able to continue the momentum of letting go that you've been going through in the, the first five stages into this, the, the, the sixth stage. So yes, that's, uh, that's the third element, is to dwell with the experience, but to allow yourself to go through the process again and again on more subtle levels. The fourth element that I want to, uh, to stress from all of this is um, taking, uh, accompanying the practice, if you're, especially if you're doing it regularly, even if you're not doing it regularly, accompanying that practice with its application within your daily experience. And to me, it seems the, the major um, <clears throat> Uh, sort of opportunity is in reaction, especially reaction, of course, to other people. And to use your reactions to other people as a, as a basis for reflection. Because in the reaction, the self-clinging is revealed. Usually we've accommodated uh, our lives to self-clinging so that they're nice and decent and uh, honourable and in accordance with the precepts. And if we're you know, living in nice Britain and in, within the context of the order and so forth, there's very little that that's really rubs. Um, and so uh, uh, we, can, we can sort of accommodate uh, to self-clinging and we can even be fooled that there were, we're much better than we think we are. And uh, I think it's extremely important to develop a, a vivid awareness of those moments of reaction and to value them. Learn to love your reactions uh, because they're a key to the underlying self-delusion, the self-clinging. Self and then to sort of mix them with the reflection that's taken place in, uh, in six element practice. Sometimes what I've found is that they sort of naturally pop themselves up when I'm doing the six element practice. I'll reflect on um, a particular incident or usually a particular person and... Uh, the, the, the practice sort of has that concrete uh, reflection, a co concrete experience behind it. But I think unless you're doing that, unless you're working it into the business of daily living, then the six element practice itself is merely another form of um, uh, bliss bunnying for those that bliss bunny or a boredom for those that don't. Uh, or intellectual titillation for those that 
intellectually titillate. So these are the four elements that I wanted to, four aspects that I wanted to bring out in relation to the practice. A lot more I could say, particularly about uh, the sixth element of consciousness, which uh, I've certainly myself had to reflect on a great deal. Um, first of all, concrete experience, uh, so that your reflection, of course it goes beyond any particular concrete experience, but it's founded in it. So all the time your reflection has got sort of a relationship with that. Then the, the, the investigation is thoroughgoing, not superficial, as uh, uh, um, intellectually tight and convincing as you can make it. It doesn't mean sophisticated or philosophical, uh, but you're applying reason uh, strongly to, uh, uh, to your experience and in, in the light of the, the Buddha's teaching and the, and, the, and the form of the practice. Thirdly, that you're um, uh, uh, working towards the moment at which um, inquiry, reflection, turns into conviction. And you're sort of staying with that conviction. And uh, that conviction will almost certainly be accompanied by a sense of opening up and freeing up. And you may be able to develop that sort of a bit independently, but don't neglect the, the rigorous inquiry. The more rigorously you investigate, the more rigorously and logically you investigate, the more deeply you will integrate the uh, conviction when it arises. And then just staying with that conviction. But always relating the practice of the three pragnas to uh, experience of um, reaction, which is where the underlying self-clinging reveals itself. Uh, this is why I think spiritual community is so important. I think the solitary meditator is a wonderful thing. But the solitary meditator apparently, um, uh, 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 not being a solitary meditator, I wouldn't, this wouldn't be my experience, but the solitary meditator is apparently in danger of uh, uh, a sort of refined self-delusion. You sometimes get this experience with, with meditators even within our order, that they live in a very, very, very sort of exalted, very subtle, but very small world. And that's the danger with the meditation route. Uh, and it needs to be brought in relationship to, uh, uh, to the world in a way that grates, um, that brings up the underlying re reaction, that the solitary meditator is in danger, doesn't necessarily have to do it, especially if they've got a good teacher, uh, 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 can easily sort of do their refinement on the basis of a refined self-clinging. Um, so, yes, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the meditator and, and the, uh, the student, as it were, the person who does a lot of reflection, needs to make sure that they're bringing that reflection in relationship to experience and in relationship to... Um, um, to conviction, if you see what I mean, into meditation, that is. And of course, people who choose to be more active on behalf of the Dhamma, uh, they need to be reflecting much more deeply on their experience so that their, their interaction on the basis of the Dhamma brings about realisation. So I hope these, these, these reflections are useful. Maybe they're obvious to everybody, uh, but uh, maybe they're not. Uh, they've certainly benefited people in India when we brought these out, so maybe they'll benefit people here. And yes, there's a lot more to say, but that'll be all for now. So we'll just break for, let's say, 10 minutes. We'll come back at five, so there's an opportunity to reflect a bit, let go of the, you know, the, the multiple words that Sabuti's just used, and I'll then come back, and I'll lead you through a fairly full pretty conventional version of the six element practice, as I remember Bante leading it, which is probably not how he really led it. I'm sure um, Archula and Devamitra and others will remind me. Um, but uh, I'll just lead it through fairly fully in the conventional way that Bante um, led us. Thank you. <laughs>